my money manager, Larry Fink, made me a lot of money. Yes. Did very good. He was in, you were in the White House with him. He had a lot of good things to say about you because he had his money with BlackRock. If you were his real money manager now, he's sitting on paper worth $5 billion. You know he's cash poor. What would you tell him to do? This is DJT, the new stock, as you know, know. everybody's talking about. Uh, you know, uh, the stock has an amazing run. Um, and uh, I think in a SPAC, you know, the Trump organization needs to hold their shares for either one or two years. So the board can tell him to sell now. They can give, and by the way, the board is not exactly the BlackRock board. It's his <laughs> son and his buddies, you know. But I, but I believe there's some covenants when they go public. Oh. I, I don't know it, but most SPACs have covenants. Well, if there wasn't a covenant, would you tell him to sell right now? You know, I don't know enough about the company, I, you know, so I, I'm not going to, I would recommend him not asking me that question. <laughs> Larry so you would give him no advice? I, I, look at it, it looks high to me on, uh, on every metrics. It looks like it's a very high stock price. But look at it, it had, there's a lot of momentum going on there. Um, time will tell, but I, it, by every metrics, it's very, you know, it doesn't make any money. By every metrics, it's a very expensive stock. You don't expect a call from him, right? Uh, I, I, I would take his call and I would give him <laughs> advice if he asked, but okay. it would, that advice would be private, Charlie. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Larry, forget about some of the IPOs lately, DJT right. and Reddit and how yeah. they've spiked. The S&P, we just showed it. To some, it looks very much like a bubble and it has the characteristics of a bubble, not just the S&P, but this entire market. It's getting frothy. It's got what many would say is a compelling story. That would be AI. What kind of meetings are you having at BlackRock about how to invest around what could be a bubble bursting? Well, first of all, I don't think it's a bubble. I think um, we're seeing more validation uh, at, with stock prices. We, we're we seeing earnings momentum in a lot of companies. Even today, you cited the Russell. So the Russell 5000 is, when that goes up at more, that's starting to tell you there's more breath in the marketplace. Um, historically, we looked at so, so much of the gains in seven stocks, but the, actually the breadth of the market is expanding. To me, that gives me a good sign. When I talk to CEOs and businesses, um, probably 80% of the companies that I'm talking to are, are seeing upward momentum. In, earn, in earnings and stuff like that. Earnings, revenue, growth, margins, productivity is up. Let's be clear, productivity fell during COVID when people were working yeah. from home. People are back in the office, productivity is increasing, productivity is a good sign for expanding margins. And so, I, look, at we read the newspapers, we listen to television, it's full of negativity. Right. And at the same time, we're having record stock Listen, levels. I love when it goes up too, but when all assets are going up, and I'm talking gold is at an all-time high or relatively close to it, Bitcoin, which of course you know about because of your iBit ETF, yes. uh, all of these assets are just spiking no matter what the news is. I think there's a strong sure. reason for the United States to have more momentum than any place in the world right now. The innovation in technology, the innovation in, in, in energy stocks in terms of oil discovery and distract and extraction. Mm -hmm. So there are many reasons why we're seeing you know greater productivity, and there is really great opportunities. But you know, my letter talked about retirement. Okay, right. retirement is not something about whether the market's up or down in any one quarter. Yeah. Okay. We we Long can't term. we can't be confused about you know one stock or a market over a quarter. This is a long horizon, and I said this is a crisis in the world today, and it's a crisis because we, we, we're spending so much time today talking about the miracles of medicine. There's not a day that you don't read or hear about the, the new wonders of some of these weight loss drugs and what, what they do in terms of eliminating you know, much of the kidney disease and liver disease and heart disease and joint diseases. So you like Ozempic, huh? <laughs> You're not on it. You, you lost a few not, pounds. I'm not on it, no, Charlie, but, um, <laughs> but I know many people who are. Headline, Larry Fink, <laughs> I'm not, not on Ozempic. I'm not on Ozempic. <laughs> but let, let's be clear, it is extending life. Yeah. And something that, that I'm also aware of, some of the new therapies for dementia, how it's extending the period of time when it really gets advanced. Might we're, we, have, we have friends that, yes, that are living but we're, longer. So we're, we're spending, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna be living longer. 
Yeah. Larry, what I love about you is you do take that long-term view. Always. You always have. Always. And your, your letters are must-reads because of that. But we do live in a short-term we do, and more than ever. More than ever. Okay, so but that's the, you, the dilemma. How do you transcend well, let's, today into something? Okay, we'll do that in a minute. But okay, I, now great. that we're in today, yep. I want to talk about you now. You and Jamie Dimon at J.P. Morgan, the CEO, you know the two biggest guys on Wall Street. Big, you know, run the biggest firms, but you're kind of the yin and yang. Of, of predicting the future here, Jamie is very negative. I mean, he thinks the Fed, well, not very, but he's significantly pes very, but pe pessimistic. He okay. would say Fed rate hikes are coming more. It's going to, something's going to happen with the economy because of that. You, you the one, I mean, listen, you nailed the Fed rate, rate hike stuff. I, yeah. Since, and I think you're going to nail it going forward at least two more. And two, one in probably, June. Probably two more. Why don't you see that having any de deleterious impact on the economy and the markets? Because most of the viewers who own homes, they own homes with a 30-year mortgage. Mm -hmm. They are not impacted by higher rates. And so we, the transmission of high rates in America are much more elongated because the average homeowner is not impacted in most places in the world. Home ownership is, uh, is a adjustable mortgage of some sort, and it resets all the time. So we have the entire mortgage industry that's having a that has a 30-year so mortgage. It, it sort of cocoons, you're saying, the, the consumer to some extent. It, it brings down the volatility dramatically, and it really gives us that. Two, um, um, we, we have corporations that have done a very good job in extending the maturities. If you look at the credit markets today, you do not see companies being stretched too right. far. Now, in the, some of the private credit areas, you're seeing are. more and more small companies, and I think this is the tale of two, two parts of the economy. The, the big, large cap companies that are part of the S&P are, are doing quite so well So they manage overall. their balance sheets well. Um, Absolutely. So the Fed, want to nail you down. Yep. Prediction on the Fed. I think, as I said now for over two years, inflation is going to be stickier. I still believe inflation is going to be stickier. But I do believe the Federal Reserve will have room to test the economy, to test the markets. In to June. To one, one, well, depending on what happens between now and June, but if everything materializes as we think it will be, they will do an easing in June and maybe one more easing between okay, now and year Okay, you just said end. maybe. All right, now. But it's always maybe. I know, I understand <laughs> that. But we felt, at least as we look at all of the data, which is still coming in strong for the U.S. economy and the market Absolutely. is doing well, yep. that there may be just one. And Raphael Bostic of the Atlanta I Fed heard, just yeah. came out and said one, one rate cut this year. Maybe. I'm not uncomfortable with that prognostication. I, you know, earlier this year, and I think when the last time I was on the show, there were many people talking about her six, six. rate cuts. And I said, I think on the show it would be no two then, and I'm still saying two. But if I had to be, have a bias, I would say one over three. Right, you know? right. I what assets right. have surprised you? I'm sorry? What assets in the last, let's say, six months and their moves have surprised you? I mean, an obvious one might oh, be no, the AI-related stocks, big tech, but what it's else? Actually, in some of those AI stocks, their yeah. earnings are actually um, validating. Like, NVIDIA's earnings are validating some of its stock price. Now, it's trading at a 30 PE, <laughs> but, and, and, and arguably it was growing faster than that. So let's see how that continues on. Look, I'm, I, I'm very bullish. Um, on the long-term viability of Bitcoin. I was going to say, did that surprise that you? That surprised me how much that's really? gone up. I mean, look, at it, it, it is, we're, we're creating now a market that has more liquidity, more transparency, and I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised, and I would never have predicted it before we filed it, that we were going to see this type of retail demand. So you thought you'd do good, yeah. but not this good? I thought, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I bid, Definitely. Is, I bid is your ETF yes. over at iShares. Yes. It's about to overtake Grayscale, which was in the business uh, certainly a lot longer. You look at the gains since fast. January 11th when it first came about. Yes. Have you ever seen this much inflow this quickly into? IBIT is the fastest growing ETF in the history, history. of ETFs. Yeah. Nothing has, That's crazy. has gained 
assets as fast as I've been in the history of ETF. Started. So Ether is next with a, an ETF? We'll see. Uh, that's, uh, that's under registration. Okay, so, so <laughs> let's just not talk about your product. Right. Talk about Ether. The SEC, there's lots of noise about them declaring Ether a security, which would take it out of the Bitcoin category as a commodity. How does that translate into an ETF? Effect? I don't think that, look, I really can't talk about it, but I don't think that designation is going to be that deterious to... Oh, really? So yeah. even if it's a security, you can start an ETF, an ETH ETF? I think so, yeah. Well, that's wild. So we got a financial locomotive heading toward a cliff, and that is well, retirement. So you're going oh, to talk cliff. more about yes. that in just a minute. <laughs> uh, as Larry said, he not on Ozempic, but many Americans are, and that is already proving to extend their lives. Yes. But our retirement funds keeping up with longer lifespans. Oh, Larry Fink says not even close. He is sounding the loudest alarms to date, but he's pairing the urgency with a fix for Americans from boomers right, to... Let's, uh, let's get out. All right, so as you guys can see, we, we uh, kind of did a, a point blank live on you guys today. Obviously, we weren't sure when Larry Fink would be coming at the top of the hour he came in. So we got a little bit in there of understanding of what's happening. And of course, we'll get back to this. He may have some more comments that would be uh, welcome on today's show. Uh, of course, the other things that are moving in the, in the news right now, which I think have a lot of um, bearing on how Fink is looking at the crypto markets, the SEC's lawsuit against Coinbase now moving forward. Uh, how bad is it? There's a few, you know, comments on this in general. Uh, the judge, everybody has, you guys know, we've talked about, uh, you know, Judge uh, Faya, uh not only found most of the SEC's claims against Coinbase fit for trial, uh, but that's going to happen. This, I don't know that this is a bad thing. It just simply means that both parties believe they've got a case and off they go. The crypto nomenclature may be of recent vintage, but there's uh, obviously been challenged transactions fall comfortably. Uh, within the framework that the courts have used to identify securities for nearly 80 years. This goes back into, all right, there might be something here for us to take a look at. So two major claims, Coinbase operates as an unregistered securities exchange for retail and institutional. Let me kind of zoom in on that for you guys so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, investors that uh, crypto staking programs constitute additional offerings, so unregistered securities. That was been, I think that was one of the big keys that the SEC was really going after. And then the third claim against Coinbase, however, is uh, the Coinbase wallet. The company conducts brokerage activity, which was di dismissed by Judge Faya. So that, or Fela, that is a pretty big move, I think, in, in the essence of what's happening overall. But back to what Fink was talking about, the fact that Bitcoin's ETF continues to see the push that we've seen, what could be, well, is already the greatest ETF ever launched in Wall Street, most likely are going to be overtaking uh, Grayscale very shortly. This leans into one thing, and that is the fact that these guys are looking at other assets out there. And I think you have to look in general. You know, the market, of course, looked at the Coinbase situation and said, okay, well, the Coinbase situation doesn't look rosy, so we're going to trial. Market kind of retraces. But this market moves on news so much. The sentiment data that comes in on this market is probably the most sensitive I've ever seen in my history and career of tracking uh, data and looking at markets over the past 20 years. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. Make sure and drop some questions. We'll try to get some of those here in a bit. We may go back to Larry Fink as well to kind of cover up because he may uh, mention a thing on retirement. I'm going to have the guys kind of monitor in on that one as well. Other things out there, this of course was Snowden come in on this very point and says, hey, this doesn't bother me if the SEC keeps acting in bad faith like this. They're going to lose so hard in court, they'll never be able to do this to anyone ever again. Remember, the SEC got spanked so badly on the Gensler had to approve the Bitcoin ETFs, uh, obviously with tears in his eyes. This is all in reference to the um, SEC proceeding with the court ruling on Coinbase. So even though I don't think the Coinbase stock really took a major hit, we did see a, a small, slight move, but I think we're going to most likely see other things happening. Here's uh, Brian Armstrong kind of hitting on it. Great progress on the SEC, huge Huge win for self-custodial wallets. That was the point we were getting at right there. This ensures on-chain ecosystems will continue to innovate. That's a big positive. Uh, and we'll continue fighting for the right to use crypto and get clarity. So self-sovereign is coming, guys. We're going to see it, I think, in a big way uh, as the markets start to envelope around what's happening in Wall Street. I think Larry Fink kind of hit it on the head. Several narratives pushing right now, the AI narrative. Uh, I would, you know, somewhat in agreement with him. I don't know if he was right about the fact that we wouldn't see all these rate cuts because there were so many people in Wall Street calling for a lot of rate cuts. We were a bit more cautious on that. I mean, just me because I'm 
kind of just mo much more pessimistic when these markets are moving in the way that they're moving. And I'm still concerned about that with the fact that we still have a very sticky inflation. So it's just something to be uh, considered about. Um, definitely one to watch. Now let's go. I've got another piece right here. Uh, Fidelity taking another step towards spot ETH through your ETF, uh, but some hurdles, you know, still coming in. And that was an interesting statement by Fink where he, they asked him, hey, well, what happens if ETH is a security? Would that really make a difference? He didn't seem to think it would on a potential ETF going in the direction of Ethereum. So the company uh, filed a registration statement. Now, these are S1s. This is something we've heard about many times here on the show. This is on Wednesday, making another step in its bid to getting the ETH uh, fund approved. Securities and Exchange Commission uh, would have to approve the 19B4. Uh, as well as deem the uh, effective the S1, basically these forms, uh, which would allow the, the fund to start trading. Uh, they didn't reveal a ticker just yet. Looks like, uh, is he coming back on? Let's get a, go back to the, to the live. We'll come back to that. With BlackRock's Larry Fink. Uh, listen, this is a national priority, at least it should be, or it becomes a national crisis, you say? Well, I think it's a global priority um, because... Um, Leaders in every country, whether it's a developed country or a developing country, are focusing on how do we prepare our citizens. And more importantly, in the countries that have small but growing capital markets, they, they see the power of the U.S. capital market. They see the power of our capitalism. <clears throat> and they are trying to develop a, a um, retirement system that will then fund their capital markets and grow their capital markets. Let's just I, explain though, when you talk about capital markets, compounded since the S&P was created, 1957, it has returned annualized returns of 10.26% every, I mean, that's amazing. And, so and that's is that we, what you are saying <clears throat> has right. to be done now? We need to be focusing on the long term. That's why the, but, the but early from a granular standpoint, just from a company standpoint, because we work for companies and sure. that's how we save retirements. Yep. How do they do it? I mean, are you saying ditching the 401k? No, no, no. I, I, and going for a defined benefit? I mean, should no, we go back there? No, by no means. I, first of all, I, I don't have any policy suggestions. What I'm suggesting is we need to have a conversation. As I said earlier, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist because we solve problems. We read papers, we watch news, and it's generally filled with negativity. Mm -hmm. And it scares us. And the whole issue of hope and fear, there's more fear in the world than yeah, I saw. Everybody. I saw something on CNBC that had a very astute guy <laughs> Talking, trying to talk the moderator out of fear and loathing on, you know, right. the into fear and loathing. Yeah. Fear and loathing. <laughs> or out of it. He, but he was trying to talk you into it. <laughs> I believe there's more opportunity for hope, and I believe there's more opportunities in the future. But we, if we don't start talking about rethinking retirement, mm -hmm rethinking how we should think about retirement plans. Well, you've got a plan called Life Path, Path Paycheck. Paycheck. Yeah. Now, talk about this, explain <clears throat> what it is. This is iShares as well. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is for a 401k or the defined right. contribution plans. Mm -hmm. um, a 401k plan, when you retire, mm -hmm. generally you get, um, you get a 100% um, of your your savings in a lump sum. Mm -hmm. And you reinvest that lump sum, but most people don't even know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and people are frightened about, can, are they gonna outlive their savings? And they might. And they may, but the, but the more you invest during your working age, the sooner you put some money away during your working age, getting back to your S&P compounding, mm -hmm. the higher probability you're gonna have a pool of assets, a pool of money, that you're gonna be able to live with dignity and, and hope during your retirement age. <clears throat> what Life Path Paycheck is, is using the same formula of this target date plan where the early years you have majority of your 401k or in equities. Well, you said 99%. And then over time, it goes more into fixed income. It's like a 529 college savings plan. Exactly, so it narrows and narrows the risk. But what we do, we add an annuity to the back end, whereby we could then define to you how much is your monthly paycheck. So it's it's like translating what a defined benefit plan was. I almost was. feel like putting the BlackRock <clears throat> uh, logo, 1-800-BLACKROCK on the bottom. Is this like an advertisement for BlackRock? Well, are you talking your book? I mean, what, and no fees, right? 
Did I see that correctly? <clears throat> there's no, for the wrapping, there's no um, wrap fee by the insurance companies in, the, in light let, of that page. Let, let me ask you one question, another question about, about this thing, because this caught me in your, in your letter. It's yep. in the letter. It's not about retirement. It's about energy. I mean, you right. basically say this could be the fact that we're Bitcoin mining like crazy. We have all these energy needs. You suggested the light could go out if we don't figure out energy infrastructure. My question to you is, which I, I really do agree with, but here's where I didn't see in your letter, why don't you just say, we need some nuclear power? Well, that's one of the answers. Um, so you, would you be in favor of more nuclear uh, power? Small nuclear reactors, absolutely, but that's, that's, that's one of many solutions. Mm -hmm. um, we, have, you know, we need to be upgrading our technology going on there. Uh, I think the key here with what Fink was talking about, and I want to play another clip for you guys uh, that gets into uh, some things around um, Fink, because there are some things around, they were talking a little bit about around the power consumption of Bitcoin. There are some other aspects of what is going on within uh, BlackRock that I think may trend a little bit more toward crypto. Let me cut to this clip uh, here on Larry Fink talking data centers. Listen in. We're going to need huge sums of money to invest in these data centers. Yes, we do. And and if we're going to be the leader, if we're going to be the leader, and I must say, when I talk to every other country, every other country wants to be a leader in, in AI, okay. and they're going to be investing in this and building data centers. And every data center people are going to want are going to be a, uh, with with uh, decarbonized technology, right. wind or solar. And so we're we're, we're seeing this uh, live. All optimistic. All right, so some of the projects that, you know, when you look at data, and this is something we follow quite a bit. Render, of course, is one of the biggest ones that we like, uh, obviously writing in the Solana network. Uh, we've shown it many times. I'll show the charts on a here in a minute. And the other one that is kind of interesting is Shadow, Shadow Drive. This is another one that is out there. Um, and I think as we see more projects, especially in blockchain, that start to make their way into whether it's rendering, data storage, even if you look at projects like Arway, Filecoin, there's so many different opportunities, I think, out there that could play into some interesting trends going into this. Now, they were talking a little bit about the situation around long-term investing. And I think the key that uh, Fink was trying to make was the retirement opportunities. And retirement opportunities, if you think about it, especially if you're young, getting into you know, these better performing assets such as you know, on-risk assets, which I think most people in the gen, um, probably from the Gen X down, meaning Gen Y and Gen Z, that is most likely gonna be flowing, I think in the next few years, more and more into crypto as we continue to see these performances take place. So that in itself, you just have to consider what's the future of Wall Street, one of the biggest futures of Wall Street right here is going to be BlackRock beginning to do asset tokenization with the launch of their digital liquidity fund. There's a couple of things happening within this. Now, the biggest issue is the fact that they are already moving in this direction. So they're already in a position right now to launch these kinds of activities, which is going to be a complete new set of financial instruments as we start to see more projects and more products coming out of Wall Street uh, going forward. So that's a big one. Now, the other thing that is happening with the SEC that I think will have a bearing on Ethereum, it'll have an, a, bearing, a bearing on a lot of the altcoins, is this right here. Tom Emmer kind of hitting on this whole issue, which was from the Financial Services GOP statement, New Republicans uh, House Financial Service Committee, and the House sent a letter to basically the Gensler saying, urging his agency uh, to clarify its position with respect to the SPPD Prometheum's custody of ETH. Now, let me kind of explain what Prometheum is. If you've been watching our show very long, you probably remember, and if you haven't, go back and watch the Prometheum videos. Just search Prometheum, you'll see it. But essentially, this is a small company that kind of came out of nowhere, very well versed, testified in front of Congress. Basically, what they were saying is they're going to be a digital assets securities exchange. And this tool set was put in place when technically the securities or the SEC was saying there is no, you know, digital securities from a crypto standpoint. So that in itself, I think, was a very big point. So it looks like we got one more, one more piece of live coming in. You guys want to come back? Yep. All right. They look like they were going to come back to something on crypto. So anyway, the point with Prometheum that I wanted to get to 
is that this company, this one particular exchange, was kind of handpicked by the SEC. And that was the issue that everybody has been watching because this guy was a little bit under, you know, the point of saying being reputable. Uh, very, you know, cagey answers, et cetera. And then out of the blue, the SEC grants their license. And now they're talking about holding Ethereum. So that's what this whole letter, letter from the uh, financial committee, uh, the GOP financial committee, was about. And if you look at Emmer, he kind of says, hey, the SEC and the CFTC have an extensive record asserting that Ethereum is not a security. So why does Prometheum, an SEC registered broker dealer, plan to custody ETH? And this goes into even this letter right here that went into Chair Gensler. Uh, and this just happened uh, this week. So this is a pretty big deal, I think, especially if we start to see the assault on Ethereum from a security standpoint. So I think that is going to be a big factor uh, going forward. Whether we see it come in, I still think this is not going to happen for Ethereum. And I still believe, and I'd love to know what you guys think. Do you think we're going to get an Ethereum you know, ETF in May? That's still another 45 days away. We'll see how that plays out. A lot of people playing into the situation, though, I think when we start to look at the opportunities for all of these um, Wall Streeters, I think the key here will be, do we see a lot of activity starting to pick up between the SEC and people like Fidelity, BlackRock, et cetera, that are going to be going in that direction? We're going to probably go to a poll real quick, and then we'll take some questions, get over to some charts for you guys, and see. No poll. No poll today. All right. So cool. Let's take a few questions, and we'll get going in. Uh, all right, so uh, Eric V says Prometheum potentially selling a commodity as a security. I know, a very interesting uh, situation. I'm not even sure if they can legally do that, if it was uh, really there. So anyway, nice to see you in the house there, Mr. Tom Crown. Neil Gamey says, so why don't we just buy more Solana? So we just buy more Solana. I like it. CFTC reiterates the Ether commodity in complaint against KuCoin. We mentioned that yesterday on the show. Um I think this is, again, the CFTC and the SEC kind of battling back and forth between who has jurisdiction over Ethereum or who has jurisdiction on some of the crypto assets that have been deemed commodities, because that's where the CFTC would come into play. So definitely a little bit of a battle there. Which stocks will we see uh, tokenized first? Hey, I, I think I'm going to look for a handful of the top tech stocks that could start to flow in there. And I think we're going to see some very interesting products and remember, Securitize was the company, I think it was Securitize, was the company out of uh, Miami that partnered with BlackRock to get that done. That is what we're watching right now in terms of looking at some of the cues that could play into this for the tokenized assets. Uh, Link would also be uh, next for an ETF. Maybe, I don't know, I'm still looking at the payment rails. I mean, there's been news about Litecoin. There's been news about XRP. Uh, there will be more ETFs, I think, going. And I think the key here is they've realized that these are huge cash cows, you know, from a financial standpoint. ETH ETF next. Uh, what's what I'm, okay, here we go. Let's go. Uh, he's easy on the ETH, ETH, on the ETH ETF. Uh, definitely. I think that's one of the things. I, don't, I look at it this way too. I think a lot of people would say, you know, Fink is bullish right now on the markets in general. And I'm, I'm agreeing with him in the sense that I feel like we are in a position right now, even though if you look at the Bitcoin chart, we'll just take a look at the chart. Bitcoin chart still has been kind of waffling right here around the 69K mark, and we're down to 68.6 today, down slightly on the day, uh, about 2%. But the key here will be after the halving. Once we see the halving uh, condition still about, what are we, about two and a half weeks away right now? Two and a half weeks away. That's going to be the key thing. Do we see another dip start to move in? And that's most likely going to have some effect on the entire crypto market with the halving. And I think it's still tied into it. Does it have an effect in the sense of seeing large corrections? I would be surprised because uh, obviously the, tr the correction we just had, let's take a look at that one right there from our top to where we were, nice 15%. So was that the correction that everybody was anticipating pre-halving? That's the real question. Because this could be a very interesting time for either dollar cost averaging if you're going that direction or if you've been waiting on the sidelines to get into a project that you're thinking, all right, maybe this is the time to jump into Avalanche. Let's take a look at Avalanche. Avalanche holding around that $50 mark. 
really for a little while right now. This is the daily. And that had a nice climb up, of course, over the past uh, month. But if you look at this resistance level around 44 bucks, whether we see this come back in this area of 44 to 50 is the question mark. And those are some of the assets that may be the buys that we've been looking for. Uh, definitely a lot of them uh, that we'll be watching. All right, if you guys like these live streams, first thing I would ask you to do is make sure and hit the like button. It's the best thing you can do to kind of give us feedback as our audience if these are worth it for you. And uh, I know you like the lives when we're doing you know, interviews and some trading analysis, but these restreams of some of these key financial individuals like Fink, like the FOMC uh, with Chair Powell, are they enough really around our analysis? Is that something you guys uh, like to see? Just you know, let us know, it always helps. And if you're not in the diamond circle, make sure and get in that. It's a great place to just get additional content. Always out there on X, it's pretty simple, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on Tech Back.